It's a supersized Twitter Tuesday mailbag. And gee, the popular topic is a certain quarterback on the New York Giants. That's coming up next here on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to a new edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. I'm Patricia Trana, back from a day off. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. If you celebrated Christmas, hope Santa was good to you. We are back here on the Locked On Giants podcast, and we have a Twitter Tuesday. And uh, the popular question continues to be all about quarterback Daniel Jones. So we got about uh, 20 questions or so that we'll go through. And uh, as always, thank you so much for not only making us your first listen of the day or of watching on YouTube your first watch of the day, but for sending in the questions. Whenever I call for questions, you guys come through and it is much appreciated. So let's get right into it. This time around, I'm going to start off with the questions received via email. And our email address if you want to send something in to us for a question, you can see it on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening, it's Locked on Giants Podcast at gmail.com. So hope we will hear from you. Let's get into the questions. All right. First up, we're going to hear from David S., who kicks it off with a question about Daniel Jones. He wants to know, do you think Daniel Jones has shown the new regime enough to warrant bringing him back? And uh, David goes on to say he's a big gun to him. He Jones is a big unknown, um, you know, sees him more of a, a game manager, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it's going to the costs to bring Jones back would be between 25, 30 million, et cetera. And is it better to bring back Jones at a cost of a second contract or hand the, hand the reins to Tyrod Taylor while developing a rookie? Okay, David, thank you for kicking off uh, the Locked on Giants podcast Twitter Tuesday with that question. Um, I disagree with you about Daniel Jones. You see him as a game manager. And I think this year he's, take, he's grown. He has, I think, the second most... Uh, come from behind wins, fourth quarter wins out of all the quarterbacks in the league. Um, he has elevated basically a bunch of receivers who might just be like three, four, five, six practice squad, maybe not even in the league. He's elevated those guys. Um, he has managed to stay healthy and he has made some really sharp decisions. Now he hasn't been perfect. No one is perfect in this game or in this world for that matter. But I think Daniel is more than a game manager. And um, to your question about turning the reins over to Tyrod Taylor, I wouldn't. No disrespect to Tyrod Taylor. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't for a couple reasons. Number one, you mentioned bringing in a rookie that, you know, maybe the management wants to roll the dice on. I don't know necessarily that the Giants are going to find a franchise quarterback where they're drafting or where they're projected to draft, which right now, if they make the playoffs, they're going to be drafting in the low 20s. Um, I'm sorry, the high 20s. So around 23, 24. I don't know that you're going to get a quarterback at that point. So what you do, and I'm going to probably repeat this a few times during the show, is you don't sign Jones to, to outrageous money. You don't sign him to a long-term contract. You structure the contract, maybe, you know, taking a, a page out of how the Bills structured uh, Josh Allen's contract, which I'm going to talk about when I do my salary cap show um, next month. And you just go from there. You continue to let Jones develop in this offense because, look, I've said it before, Jones is starting from scratch with this new system, this new coaching staff. This is quarterbacking one-on-one -on -one for him. And I think, considering that this is level one, all things considered, he's done pretty good. 
um, all things considered. And, you know, I know people are going to say, well, what about the other three years or so? This coaching staff, I, I don't think is as bothered by that as maybe some of the fans are. So that's kind of where I see things going with Daniel Jones. Thanks for that question. All right. Up next is a question for from Gerald A. regarding wide receiver. Hodgins and Daniel Jones are showing real chemistry, although not a number one at wide out. He's, Hodgins is starting to show he can be dependable. Do you think he can be used as a number one since we have Wandale Robinson on the roster and maybe get a smaller, another smaller, stockier, speedy guy? All right, Gerald, thank you for that question. I don't think Hodgins is a number one. I think, you know, they either got to trade for one or they're going to just have to draft the guy uh, to be a number one. I think Hodgins can be a number two, maybe even a number three. Um, but, you know, e even with this coaching staff, they kind of um, – they rotate guys, you know, so just when you think, you know, this guy's a number one and this guy's a number two and this guy's a number three, it changes every week. So I do think Hodgins has a future with this team. I like what I've seen from him. And I did ask Brian Dable actually about him today um, on, on his on the Monday conference call with reporters. I asked him about Hodgins and I said, you know. We always talk about how receivers, you know, they come in and they look so comfortable because they played in the system. But, you know, Hodgins is obviously how to get comfortable playing with Daniel Jones. And what is that? What do you attribute that to? And Dable basically said that, you know, in between practice periods, he's in there with Daniel Jones on a variety of routes, throwing, you know, and catching. They're talking about things and uh, that have been installed, and uh, Hodgins is trying to see things through Daniel Jones's eyes. So those are all things that he's done to kind of bring himself up to speed as quickly as he has. And he's done a great job. You know, he he can definitely, I think, be a number two receiver moving moving onward. But um, as far as being a number one, nah, I, I I don't think that's he's he's there yet. So, but thanks for the question. All right, up next. Louis P., you and others speak about giving Daniel Jones a short-term, relatively cap-friendly deal. Wishful thinking on all of you. As a free agent, Jones will command a much more lucrative deal than you imagined from another quarterback-hungry team. And uh, let's see, Lewis goes on to mention the Panthers and Commanders, given Jones's background in, from North Carolina. Um, and then he goes on to say the Giants will have to franchise tag Jones and that Lawrence Tyne of Blue Rush reported that several of his friends league-wide Working for or with other teams have told them that Jones will get long-term offers in the average range of $45 million per year if he hits the free agent market. Lewis, let me give you some, some numbers here, all right? $45 million a year, um, that's Patrick Mahomes' money, all right? Uh, Josh Allen is making $43 million per year. Daniel Jones ain't making Patrick Mahomes' money, my friend. He's not making Josh Allen money. He's 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 not there yet, you know. So so no disrespect to Lawrence Tynes, who I love to, to pieces, and I believe that he has you know sources around the league. I just don't see Daniel Jones getting that kind of money. I would be shocked if he gets that kind of money. Um, what kind of money might he get? You know, uh, Joel Corey of um, a former NFL agent who writes a column on CBS Sports. Reference Blake Bortles, the type of deal that Blake Bortles got a few years ago. And um, I've referenced, you know, Ryan Tannehill's deal and uh, Derek Carr's deal uh, over at the Raiders. Now, I'm working on what I think Jones will get per year. I do think that Jones will get a contract in which there are incentives to boost up the per year value. I think he'll have roster bonuses each year to boost it up. But yeah, I, I'm not so sure. I, I'd be shocked if he gets the equivalent of what Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen are getting per year, because he's just not in that category. You know, I, and I, I agree with you. There are quarterback hungry teams, but yeah, I, I just don't see it. I'm, I'm sorry. I disagree there. So, but thanks for the question. Appreciate it. All right. Next we hear from, uh, let's see. This is Scott S. 
While I have confidence in Evan Neal to improve Aiken to Andrew Thomas's growth, the interior O-line is worrisome. To me, it's no coincidence that the team's worst rushing performance was when Bredesen was out. Is there any chance Matt Parrott could slide to right guard? This would allow draft capital to be deployed elsewhere. Um, Scott, I, I think you got your positions mixed up. Glowinski's a right guard. Um, Bredesen is a left guard. So, okay, let's see. So, you're okay, my bad. You're, you're saying, can he replace Glowinski? Um, I don't think that happens next year. I looked up Glowinski's contract, and let me just see. Glowinski's contract, if the Giants were to bench him or cut him, they're looking at 8.65 million in dead money. Glowinski's got 5.65 million guaranteed. Now, could Matt Parrott play right guard? Yeah, I think he's dabbled in it. I don't think next year's going to be the year they do that. I really don't. Um, what we may need to find out about Glowinski is, is he banged up? And we just don't know about it. You know, you mentioned Bredesen. I think Bredesen, if I'm not mistaken, and I'll check real quick, I think he is a free agent after uh, this year. But let me just double check that. Yes, Bredesen. No, I'm sorry. Bredesen it has one more year. He signed through 2023. So... You maybe plug him in at left guard and Bredesen, you just hope whatever he's got going on. And I, I wonder if he has an injury that they're just not talking about that's affecting his play. You just try and get him better. So I, I don't think Parrot makes that switch next year, but it's an interesting thought. Definitely. So, all right. Next up, we hear from Elizabeth C. We're on the Twitter questions now. Elizabeth writes, have you ever seen a player travel with the team like Sterling Shepard still is? Is it common? What do you think that says about him and the coaching staff? Yes, Elizabeth. Players, injured players on IR have traveled with the team. Saquon did it a couple of years ago when Joe Judge was the head coach. And basically all that says is, you know, the player is, is a leader. Um, he wants to be part of the, the, the team, even though he can't play. You know, wants to be active on the sideline, either coaching guys up or cheering them on or whatever. Nothing wrong with that. I, I have no problem with that. If a guy is physically capable to stand on the sideline, go for it. Um, and I think that's great that the coaching staff allows that because these guys are part of the team. And again, even though they can't practice and, and play in games, there are things that they could do around the facility, whether it's watching film with teammates or whatever. So you just don't throw a guy to the curb just because he's injured in I on IR. So good on Shepard for, for remaining um, active as he has. Um, okay, next up we hear from Adriana Ayafola, I think is how you say this. What's going on with Rodarius and Belton? Both proved to be good players on the field, and I don't believe they just had a bad week of practice, and that's why they're not practice. That's why they're not playing. They both have better hands than McLeod. Is Rodar Rodarius really being punished for the tweet? Okay, we actually got that question from a few other people, so I'm just kind of answering it um, just this one time. With regards to Rodarius, I don't think he's being punished for the tweet. But a couple weeks ago, Wink Martindale was asked about it. And he kind of alluded to the fact that Rodarius hasn't been practicing as well as the guys in front of him, the guys that are getting snaps. So it's not all about the tweet. I really believe that. Um, I think it's just Rodarius, for whatever reason, is just not practicing as well as he could be. And as has been the case with this coaching staff, if you don't practice well, you don't play. It's that simple. Belton, I think, um, you know, you, you got to remember, he missed time during the summer with the broken clavicle. So he did kind of fall behind a little bit, and he did struggle a little bit um, when he finally got in there. So I think that's what is going on there. I, I don't think anybody's being punished. It's just, you know, sometimes you got to take a step back and let these rookies catch their breath, their breath um, in the case with Belton. So that's kind of, I think, what the situation is there. All right, Giant fans, we've got 
a ton more questions here on this Twitter Tuesday. We'll have more for you coming up right after this. Hey, Giant fans, have you ever wanted to show NFL GMs how it's really done? Well, you can start by hooking up with Ultimate Football GM, where you have the final say over every aspect of your roster. Among the decisions you can make include hiring the coaches and coordinators, making trades, drafting, and free agency. All of this in a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Football GM is completely free and playable offline. Play on the go, as you want, when you want. We at Locked On NFL Network are already competing against each other, and we're just having such a blast. We know you will, too, when you compete against your friends. So go ahead and get started. Locked On Giants podcast listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code Locked On in the game store. To download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. That's ultimate-gm.com. Ultimate Football GM. Start your dynasty today and don't forget that promo code locked on for your 100% roster boost. Hey, Giant fans, thanks so much for making the Locked On Giants podcast your first listen every day. Make sure to check out Locked On Sports today, the biggest stories around the sports world in 20 minutes or less. Plus, get instant reactions, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. Locked On Sports today, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, everybody, welcome back to Locked On Giants podcast. I'm Patricia Trena. You got a Twitter Tuesday. A lot of questions about Daniel Jones. Um, offensive line is a popular question. I'm just looking at my list here. Defense, secondary. But we have a, a, a pretty good mix otherwise um, in between all these questions. So thank you again for all the wonderful questions. And um just keep it here on the Locked on Giants podcast. We'll be here all week. Wednesday, we'll have another show for you. I'll pick a topic unless I get an interview somewhere along the line. Thursday will be the crossover show with Locked on Colts. I'm not sure which of the co-hosts are coming on with me, so I have to find that out. And then at some point, i got to find out when we're doing Locked on Live with Tana and the dog. Yes, we're going to do Locked on Live. Dog was disappointed that the Giants didn't wrap up the, the home the uh the the playoff berth but uh hey that's what why you come back and you play again so they'll have another chance this week to do that all right let's get back to your twitter tuesday questions we'll hear from kermudjuan 68 <coughs> excuse me so when the giants so with the giants uh playoff berth clinched when they beat the colts got to love that that uh that positivity uh would you sit all the key players for week 18? No, absolutely not. What's the, okay, this is kind of like what happened in 2007. The Giants clinched a playoff berth. They played the, the Patriots. Um, everybody was like, Tom, you know, to Tom Coughlin, oh, you got to sit your starters. Don't risk them getting injured. And he said, nuts to that. I'm playing my starters to get them experience, get them some momentum. Same attitude here. I mean, if you're Brian Dable, you don't sit guys, you know, unless somebody's really banged up, I could see that guy sitting, but no, I I I wouldn't do it. Absolutely not. So um, all right. Next question comes from Satoshi Guacamoto. Are the Giants fan base actually is the Giants fan base undervaluing Daniel Jones? Seems like many teams will want to sign Jones to be their quarterback, but Giant fans act like Jones has almost no value. Satoshi, I have never seen um, a player split the fan base this much. I mean, it's been a while, I should say. I think the last time there was a great debate like this, you'd have to go back to Eli Manning. And even then, eventually, you know, the tides kind of turned. But Daniel, yeah, he's been a polarizing figure. And you do have people who want him gone. You have people that want him to stay. Um, you have people who don't think the Giants will be able to keep him, that he's going to be in demand around the league. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Um, if I'm Daniel Jones, I try and work something out with the Giants. Um, it would behoove him, I think, to come back to the same system 
with the same coaching staff and just continue to get better because there are things that he is not yet doing, namely the deep ball, for example, which because of his leaky pass protection, he hasn't really had many opportunities, but he's not yet doing that um, on a consistent basis. So I don't see the harm in coming back for another year. Now, that's why I keep saying that if you're Jones and the Giants, you do a short-term contract. Maybe even have an you know a avoidable year, have an option year. It could be a player option or a team option. I mean, there are things you can do, but you know, I I could see what your point about other teams around the league maybe want having interest in Jones. But um, yeah, if I'm the Giants, I look to get that done before uh, the start of free agency. So that's how I see that. All right. Next, Giants fan, NY Giants News 26. What do you see out of what do you see out of the Giants slot cornerback Darnay Holmes? Do you think he's the future? And what do you think of his play? Do you think Wink lights him in his defense? I think he gets beat a lot, but is all around average starting material. Um here's the thing with Darnay Holmes. What I see is a very aggressive guy who, despite his height, I think he's like 5'8", five, 5'9", five, something like that, he plays much bigger than his size. The problem that I see with Darnay Holmes year in and year out, is he a little too aggressive, a little too grabby. And I was curious because I, I seem to recall him being up there in penalties. And I looked it up on the official league stats he leads the Giants with eight penalties, six of which have resulted in first downs. So Holmes is still a little grabby, especially when he gets beat. Um, I just think it's kind of interesting how every year it seems the Giants try and draft over him. You know, a couple of years ago it was Aaron Robinson. Um, you know, they drafted Cordell Flott. So I'm not sure what to make of that. But uh, look, I I like Holmes. You know, when he's on his game, he's very good. But the grabbiness, I could do without. Um, you know, but the aggressiveness, got to like that. And uh, I think if he cleans up his technique further and gets better, why not have him as part of the rotation? So, okay. Uh, Brennan Neal says... There's no way the Giants can afford to pay both Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. What do they do? Brennan, there is a way. All right. Worst case scenario, this is what they do. I looked up the minimum salary for Daniel Jones and for Saquon Barkley. And uh, the fifth year minimum salary, $1.08 million. The six-year minimum salary, $1.08 million. Here's how contracts work, Brennan. Usually the first year, the base salary is low. And the reason for that is the player is signing for a, for, you know, a roster bonus or a signing bonus. The signing bonus, which is prorated over the life of the contract. So let's say, for example, Daniel Jones signs... Um, a contract and it's 20 million a year and it's a th uh, actually let's let's make it e uh, easier let's say he gets an 18 million dollar signing bonus for a three-year deal that prorates to six million per year for cap purposes now daniel's going to get all that money up front but it's only only six million is going to count against it the first year six million the second year and six million the third year that's why you see a lot of contracts uh, second, especially second uh, and third contracts by players signed, the base salary is usually kind of low. It's because, you know, you're giving him all that money up front, all that cash up front. So if you give Daniel Jones the minimum 1.08 million, and then you give him 18 million as a signing bonus, and then maybe you throw in 500,000 as a workout bonus, and why not throw in a, a roster bonus as well? Now you get him up there to that average, that APY that maybe is competitive with his peers. So that's how they can do that with Jones and also with Barkley. Now, I do think Barkley's contract 
is going to be more complicated to get done, which is why I would not be surprised if Barkley is franchised, but we'll see. We'll see how, uh, how quickly they get these things done. I found it interesting that, you know, Barkley's reps, um, that Joe Shane, the general manager, reached out to Barkley's reps over the buy, not Daniel Jones's. And to some, that means that, um, you know, at the time, the Giants weren't sure if Jones was coming back. Or it could mean that maybe they've, they have an idea what they're going to do with him, whereas with Barkley, they just kind of needed to have some preliminary discussions to see what it might take for him. So that's where that one is. We'll see how it, how it plays out. All right, up next, let's see. Uh, Nick Rosario asks, what's the most realistic scenario for the wide receiver one situation this offseason? All right, Nick, um, to be determined, I mean, I've seen suggestions that the Giants trade for a wide receiver one. I would think that because they didn't trade for one at the trade deadline, I'd be surprised that they did, did it, you know, uh, given all the needs that they have. I think maybe they draft one. I mean, uh, the free agent class, if I remember correctly, the, the free agent wide receiver class is not right as of right now at any rate, one to jump up and down about. So I would think the most realistic scenario is maybe to, to draft a wide receiver one. Um, if, you know, if the Giants can trade for one and it not have, have it cost, have it cost them, you know, an arm and a leg, which I don't think will be the case, but if, somehow they can work it out, then maybe I could see them trading, but they're not one receiver away. Um, so that's why I think, you know, you bring back Isaiah Hodgins, you maybe try and bring back Darius Slayton. You're going to get Wandale Robinson back at some point. I don't think he'll be ready to start next year, but you'll get him back at some point. Maybe you add a, a, a veteran free agent um, and you never know who's going to become available. Sometimes guys shake free that we weren't even counting on. And then you just see what you can do in the draft. So that's that's how I think that's going to play out. So thanks for that question. All right. Up next, we hear from Mike Weiss. Is it too late for the Giants to receive a comp pick for Evan Ingram? Yeah, Evan's uh, tearing it up down there in, uh, in Jacksonville, isn't he? Um, Mike, yes, it is too late. Um, according to Over the Cap, which has the comp pick projections. The signing of Mark Lewinsky cancels out the Ingram um, comp pick that they would have gotten. So I don't see that changing. And, you know, Lewinsky's a starter like Ingram. And, you know, I know there's this complicated formula. I've never quite understood what the formula is. I've tried to fi figure it out, but uh, over the cap does such a good job of it. Um, but yeah, I, it, it is too late, unfortunately. So Better luck next year, I guess. All right, Giant fans, we have um, about six more questions left on today's show. We're going to get to those right after this. Hey, Giant fans, playing daily fantasy based on player projections has never been easier when you visit prizepicks.com. Pick two to five players, and if they go on to score more or less than their prize picks projections, you win up to 10 times the amount of your money. It's that easy. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize Picks is currently operational in over 30 states and in Canada, and they offer projections on every sport. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less, and Prize Picks offers safe and fast withdrawals. Download the Prize Pick app today or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. Don't forget to enter that promo code locked on at sign up at pricepicks.com. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. I am Patricia Trena. Thank you so much for joining me on this Twitter Tuesday. A lot of questions about Daniel Jones, the offensive line. Um, got some duplicates actually this week. So if you didn't hear your name called, that means I picked up your question. Um, somebody else might have asked it. So um, hopefully I got everybody's question in. And if you didn't hear your question, 
send it in again anyway, because you know I do a mailbag over on Giants Country that drops every Saturday. So send it to me and I can always pick it up there if you didn't hear your name call or you didn't hear your question called. So um, check that out as well. All right, let's get back to your Twitter Tuesday questions. Brisk Speculation asks, do you see Kayvon Thibodeau as an LT type? Okay, LT, of course, being Lawrence Taylor, the great Lawrence Taylor. No, I do not see Thibodeau right now as an LT type. LT was something really special, changed the way the game was played, forced other teams to come up with new ways to defend him. You know, the H-back, for example, I think was one such way. Um, putting an offensive lineman on him was another thing that I think back in the day they did to slow him down. Kayvon Thibodeau is going to be an impact player. There's no doubt about it. But to put him in the LT category, not right now. I can't honestly say that. Will he become that type of player? To be determined. You know, right now, I would be happy if he became, um, as far as a pass rusher, if he became a Michael Strahan type, which is not a bad, you know, model to emulate. I would be happy if Thibodeau became a JPP. And I and I know JPP and, and Strahan play defensive end and Thibodeau was outside linebacker, but I'm talking in terms of a pass rusher and an edge setter against the run. Um, only one LT. <laughs> it's going to be a long, long time before another LT comes along, if at all. He was just that special. But uh, thanks for the interesting question, nonetheless. All right. Um, Matt. Matt uh, Whittier. Transition tag for Daniel Jones. Who says no? Oh, interesting question there. Interesting proposal, Matt. Um let me uh, give you the number here. I know I looked this up. Okay. The transition tag for quarterbacks is estimated at $28.049 million. The franchise tag is $31.497 million. The difference, of course, is with the franchise tag, the non-exclusive franchise tag, um, if somebody comes along and signs Daniel to an, an offer sheet, the Giants get two first-round picks automatically. Um, with the transition tag, if somebody signs Daniel to an offer sheet, he, um, the Giants have, I think, seven days to match it or he walks. So I don't know if you're the Giants, if you want to necessarily have somebody else negotiate the deal for your quarterback. I think that's a little risky. So. If I'm the Giants again, I look to get Daniel Jones done before free agency. You know, you sit down with him, you say, look, Daniel, you did well in this first year with uh, with Dable and, and Kafka. Give yourself another t uh, round if you can. The money will come. You continue to develop and stay healthy. The money will come. And see what happens. I mean, you know, will Daniel forsake the Giants and and and? Think that there's greener pastures elsewhere? He could, I suppose, but I don't know necessarily that that's the smart thing for him to do. But it depends. It really depends. You know, there's going to be quarterback movement this this uh, off season. Um, so we'll just have to see how it how it all plays out. And of course, you know, you're going to have teams that are drafting at the top of the draft that are going to get quarterbacks. So there's a lot of uh, moving parts. Kind of too early to call it right now, but I think it would behoove Daniel to come back on a short-term contract, which if he outplays it after a year or two, you rip it up and you give him a longer-term deal, like a Mahomes or a, or a Josh Allen type of deal. So that's how I would do it. So we'll see if that's how the Giants and Jones do uh, go about it. All right, up next, Michael Tauber. Which is the weakest position on the team? Receiver? Offensive line, middle linebacker, or cornerback? Should the Giants spend money to sign a star at the position like Tremaine Edmonds? All right, Michael, it looks like you think cornerback is definitely the weakest position on this team. 
truth be told, I mean, they're all pressing needs that have to be addressed. I don't know that you could honestly say that one spot is really weaker than the other. Well, maybe you can. Maybe you could say middle linebacker. But then again, you know, they're going to get Darian Beavers back off the ACL. Um, at cornerback, eventually Adoree Jackson's going to come back. Um, you would think Aaron Robinson's going to come back. So, you know, offensive line, yeah, you can make a, a case that that position needs some some beefing up in the interior. But I would say maybe, you know, if I had to pick one, I would say receiver. Because this is a group they're going to probably totally redo. So, you know, that would probably be my pick. Now, will they sign somebody? I do think they will look to add via free agency. They'll have a healthier cap situation. I do not think they're going to go crazy, though. Because Joe Shane has said he wants to sign his own guys. So you've got Daniel Jones to worry about. You've got Saquon Barkley to worry about. Um, you've got eventually Andrew Thomas. Dexter Lawrence has to be addressed. You're going to probably want to extend uh, Leonard Williams to get his cap number down. So there's some work to be done with the Giants' own roster, I think, before we can sit here and say, oh, are they going to be competitive or are they going to make a splash in free agency with other teams' free agents? So, uh that's how I think it's going to play out. But, you know, we'll see what Joe Shane does with a healthy cap situation. It's his second free agent period coming up as GM, but really his first with a healthy cap situation. So I'm curious to see how it plays out, too. So, all right. Um, all right. We just answered Michael's questions. So let's see. Let me go to the next one. Fidel Barraza, will you join us to talk Giants football on our podcast? Fidel, thank you so much for the kind invitation. I do appreciate it. I get a lot of requests to join people on podcasts, and I wish I could say yes to all of them. Um, just not enough time in the day. <laughs> it's, it, it's you know, between doing this podcast and also doing the work over at Giants Country and running, you know, to and from East Rutherford, just not enough hours during the season uh, and during the day. Maybe in the off season, we could look at doing something, but... Um, for the time being, you know, thank you for the kind offer, but just I got to write out the rest of the season. And then if there's playoffs, my workload is going to double. So, um, you know, circle back, let, you know, follow up with me in a few months and we'll see maybe, maybe again, something in the off season when it slows down a little bit. All right. Next up, we hear from Andrew B. How much impact would a playoff berth have in accelerating this rebuild? And how much would not making the playoffs possibly impact this rebuild? Andrew, I think for your first question, how much of an impact would, would the, making the playoffs impact the, uh, the rebuild? If you're a veteran player, you want to play on a, a team that has a chance to win the Super Bowl. You know, you hear it all the time. You hear players say, I want to win. All right. Now, yes, money is important, but there are guys that want to win. They want to win a championship. So getting to the playoffs, I think, can help with recruiting, um, especially if the team continues to trend upward like they've been doing. Not making the playoffs, I'm not going to say that it's going to hurt them in the rebuild. If anything, you know, I think Joe Shane at this point has a pretty good idea where this team is lacking and where he has to go and get, you know, additional talent. So I'm not going to say it's going to hurt, but, you know, it, it really depends on, I guess, what happens, you know. Uh, how do they lose if, if, you know, if they get bounced out of the playoffs? What Do, do coaches move on or anything like that? That's, that might be a deciding factor, but um, I, I'm not so sure it's going to greatly impact um, their rebuild because – they know what they need to do. So thanks for the question. Uh, okay, we got that one in. Got a couple more here. Uh, Matthew W., can we do better than one and done in the playoffs? Hey, why not? I'm not going to sit here and say no. I mean, realistically, odds are against them. Um, but you never know. That's why you line up and you play the game. And I think a lot's going to depend on who they draw in the first round, if they get into the playoffs, that is. Can't assume that they're in until they're in. 
um, you know, if by chance they get Minnesota again, I definitely think they could, you know, beat Minnesota if they play a cleaner game. If they draw the Niners, which right now, if the playoffs were to start today, I think that's who they would draw. Um, I'd have to study the Niners a little close, more closely, but again, you line up and this is why you play the game. You never say never. So I'm not going to sit here and say, no, the Giants are not going to, you know, that they're definitely going to be a one and done. I mean, my heart's probably saying, I, I should say my head's saying probably one and done because of the deficiencies on the roster, but my heart's saying you got to go for it and just see. So, all right. One more question on today's Twitter Tuesday from James A. The Colts defense looks pretty good. How did the Giants attack them and who do they need to account for? Gilmore in the secondary, et cetera. James, um, thanks for the question. I haven't done my work yet on the Colts. <laughs> it's Monday night, so I'm, I'm recording this. Haven't done my work yet on the Colts, but please tune in Thursday uh, when we do the crossover show with Locked on Colts. Um, and then on, uh, it's either going to be Thursday night or Friday. I've got to find out when, but uh, on Locked on Giants Live, we will talk about the matchups, okay? By then, I will have done some work on it. I know Tana and Dog will have done their homework on it. So, yeah, or, or these early week, you know, questions on, on the opponent, I'm still kind of wrapping up from the weekend. So um, I don't have an answer for you yet, but I promise we'll have answers for you on the, on the crossover show and on Locked On Live. So tune in for that, please, and um, we'll get to those questions. All right, everybody, that does it for this edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, Twitter Tuesday. Lots of great questions. Um, did my best to answer them. Again, if you did not hear your questions, um, send them to me again, and I'll pick them up for a mailbag on Giants Country. The mailbag publishes on Saturday morning, 8 a.m. So if you get your questions into me by like Friday, by nine o'clock at night, should be able to pick them up and get them into the mailbag. So that will do it for us. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day or if watching on YouTube, your first watch of the day. I'm Patricia Trader. We'll talk to you again tomorrow, Giants fans.